Welcome back to International Finance. I am Andy Kim, your Dr. Finance, and uh, we will go through capital adequacy standards of international banks, right? It's about understanding the banks. If you took the class uh, by Han Jung Ho Gyosunim about uh, depository institutions or understanding banking, financial institutions like that, um, you may, must be familiar with this. But assuming that you did not, right, I'm just going to say it, right? Um, here, um, bank capital adequacy refers to the amount of equity capital and other securities a bank holds as reserves, right? Um, what the heck is that capital adequacy, right? Well, it gets back to um, this bank balance sheet. In the first video, I told you about this bank balance sheet management balance sheet, right? In your left hand side, you have assets, right hand side, you have liabilities and equities over here. To start a banking business, you need some initial investment from the equity holders. You remember as just like any other businesses, right? You need equity investors and then you receive a lot of deposits, right? Deposits. That's um, your liabilities, interest bearing debt, deposit, right? Wow, I got a lot of, you, you know, as a banker, you know, millions of people put deposit into your banks, right? You may feel like, oh, I got so much money, other people's money. You might feel happy to see this huge amount of money, but this is nothing but your liability. You have to manage it somehow, right? It's a debt. You have to pay interest to them and then at random time they will you know withdraw from your banks right that's your liability and so what you do with this well invest somehow invest and then uh, loan out loan loan to uh, all different corporations or to individuals millions of different borrowers right da, 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 da right loans loan portfolio i told you about that right and if you look at this picture immediately you see a problem here why the value of your deposit is this much or, or I, sh I should say this much right the value of your deposit what you owe is this much but out of it you have to do your business as much as the value of the loan and you want this loan value the market value of your loan your market value of your asset to be bigger than the value of your liability somehow how could that be possible right of course initial investment of the equity holders you must have thrown in some cash over here so that some part of it will be sitting over here cash initial investment but that's not that much because you invest into hard assets and fixed assets, something like that, and then invest into something else, right? It may, it may come and go. But the thing is, uh, at least your asset value has to be bigger than your loan value somehow, okay? Otherwise, you will be in trouble. You'll be screwed, which, call, which is called insolvent, insolvent. All the troubles happen, right? What if the economic shock happens like Great Depression or a financial crisis in the, all around the world so that your loan value or loan portfolio's value shrinks down? Aha, shrinks down. Well, up until as long as, as long as you have enough of equity capital left, right? You are okay, right? You're okay. But as the if your asset value reduces even further, you are in trouble. You become insolvent, right? Equity value shrinks, you know, it, 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 you know uh, equity, these equity holders are, how do you say, the residual claimants. So after liquidating all these assets, you first repay to your debt holders or the deposit holders, and then whatever is remaining, that's the portion the equity holders get okay if nothing is left the equity investors are just you know 
are left with nothing, zero. Okay, that's the limited li uh, it's, what's that limited liability feature of it. But you have to be more responsible for that as a banker because the the whole country, the government, is concerned about you. This is the banking business is about the blood uh, vessels or the circulation of your uh, blood and for, throughout the economy. So that you have to be much more responsible for that. How do you manage this okay, asset so that you have enough of buffer capital over here? This capital adequacy is about how much you have enough of capital so that you can prevent your bank insolvency. Okay? There is a three pillars, three important things of capital adequacy. Minimum capital requirement, which has to do with this buffer equity capital, equity. We usually, in, in banking literature, we say okay, buffer capital because it works like a bumper or buffer, like a saving your butt. <laughs> All right, like that. You can see that? Um, so the buffer capital, you want to have it enough, right? Supervisory uh, review process. Uh, because this is countries, right? It has a lot to do with the country's macroeconomy. The regulator regulators supervise your business very intensively. Um, having said that, these days, those fintech, right, or tech fin companies bring a lot of uh, questions in this respect. It, because of the sexiness of the technology itself or fintech itself, um, those fintech companies seem to bypass or they don't go through this go through this kind of intensive supervisory process at all and that complaint is well written by jamie diamond's letter to shareholders in 2021 or something how should i say it um recently published jamie diamond uh you google search it letter to shareholder right this year, the most recent one, it goes about 60, 60 pages and some part of it, significant part of it is a complaint about this. We get so much supervisory and we can't do anything, right? Because of the super, uh, you know, regulators say, don't do this, don't do that. I, we're stuck. But they do a lot more freedom over there, fintech guys. Why don't you regulate those uh, PayPal guys? And then, you know, um, Right, toss in Korea or this kind of guy. Um, it's unfair. Makes sense, actually. I, I wouldn't say that's childish or, or a complaint or something like that. It has a reason, right? There is a reason why the bank has been conservative. It's like 5,000 years of history justifies this kind of regulation. But fintech guys, aren't we too much uh, lured by the sexiness of fintech? Too much. And uh, that may be incurring a lot of bubble together with it. And what if the crash happens in the end and then another banking crisis coming from fintech? Ah, people make same mistakes time and again. I told you last time about it, right? Um, we have to be critically, critically evaluating which one is good, which one is not. Okay. That's over here again. Effective use of market discipline. Okay, so we're going to get back to uh, get to these ideas uh, one by one. So wait for that. Now, uh, let me erase this one. Move to the next one. Yeah, Basel, Switzerland. Your lady. Yeah, anybody likes it? Your song. I like it. Uh, Pengsu. Yeah, Basel. Actually, if you Google search Basel in Korean uh, uh, language, Basel. You will find the yodel clock in Korea. E European students, right? Uh, foreign students, if you want to go for yodel song club, Korea has many of them. Japan has many of them somehow. <laughs> um, Basel, right, uh, is one of the club's name. Anyway, <clears throat> I should stop it. Should look more serious. And then Basel is the place where we have Bank of International, Se uh, International Settlement, BIS, the central bank of the central banks. Okay? Um, there, um, BIS ratio is imposed and they are determining those capital adequacy regulation. The thing is, 
the central banks they set up the rules for other banks right in their domicile or inside the country and then the central bankers get together and uh, make a contract or a accord they say accord okay they promise it with each other so that they will uh, impose some standard way of regulating the uh, banks in their own uh, in, in each country otherwise the banks will try to uh, find out um, the countries with the most uh, lax or uh, problematic um, regulator regulatory environment they will fly away from the countries they were you know regulating heavily um, so they they try to work in coordinated fashion uh, so these BIS is the coordinator of this regulation regulators right and then there's the most important function uh, part of it is economic advisor right the economic researchers um, the most famous one is Hyun Song Shin as it turns out he is the head in that economic research as BIS and he's a Korean one used to be a Princeton professor um, very famous one in economic theory um, so go ahead and Google search his papers and then you see this Switzerland beautiful and then Basel Accord yeah so 1988 they set up, set up this uh, something called BIS ratio it's about the capital adequacy how much of a buffer capital you want to have in your balance sheet that is the idea okay um, Bank of International Settlement, the uh, central bank for clearing international transactions between national and central banks, a facilitator in research, reaching international banking agreements among its members. So if you Google search it, BIS website is there. And then balance sheets of banks, equity works as a buffer capital. And then you may wonder, why do you call it buffer capital instead of saying just book value of equity? Um, Here's the reason why um, you want to, you know, among those liabilities in the bank balance sheet, right? Among those liabilities, there are some of the um, parts of or some of the liabilities that actually looks more like um, equity, something in between. And then you, you, there is a spectrum, there's a degree, different degrees of um, freedom, Okay, degrees of freedom in terms of whether it can work as a buffer for the bank versus not okay tier one is called core capital tier two is supplemental capital so tier one is is really a hardcore uh buffer capital that's the savior of the last resort and then the tier two is including something more as okay, something uh, measuring in a more uh expensive way uh, supplemental capital included so preferred stock right core capital first shareholders equity and retained earnings so if you look at balance sheet asset liabilities and equity this is essentially the book value of equity which is shareholder equity and retained earnings right um, capital adjustment or any other things forget about it right CPA I'm not a CPA I'm not going to ask you about uh, any more detailed things right uh, essentially this is the one that's the hardcore the essential part of being buffer okay to stay away from this you know crisis or something like that and then supplemental capital is preferred stock oh in the equity part there's something more like uh, working as a uh, like a liability preferred stock is as opposed to common stock you have to pay the dividend no matter what I mean not a no matter what but you, you try to pay it as much just like you pay interest to your debtors right so that's why it's something in between the preferred stock and subordinated bonds okay subordinated bonds so that's the liability part over here liability part the preferred stock is uh, something uh, equity but that's not as much as equity there's a degree of freedom right um, and then over here this is uh, uh what is it subordinated bond subordinated um which is a how do you say there's a seniority okay when you look at the liabilities of bank right or debt um there is a, a subordinated debt versus um non-subordinated debt 
right? Um, 부순이 채권 in Korean terminology. So when you repay the debt, there is a priority, okay? Um, and then so for subordinated debt, you have to pay it, repay it uh, after you repay to non-subordinated debt first, okay? Or collateralized debt or all these kind of uh, uh, other debts, right? Uh, you repay first. There's a prioritized debt part that you have to repay. And then there's a sub subordinated debt, sub-debt, we say. Okay? Um, so first, uh, if you liquidate your asset, if the market value of it is, market value of it is as small as like this, then all of it goes to, um, what is it? The non-subordinated debt holders. Okay? First, they, they got the priority. Of course, the depositors in your banking, right? They are the first priority. And then that's the first way of raising you know, money for the banks. And then previously I said as if 100% of your liabilities is deposit, but that's just a simplified picture. In fact, your liability, a part of it, significant part of it, of course, or major part of it, deposit, but uh, the banks also issue or borrow money from the capital market. They issue some bonds in the capital market um, in addition to the debt they have. So there's a layers of bonds that fill up your liability section. The bonds, um, sub-debt is also their convertible bonds or subordinated bonds can be issued and this kind of sub debt okay because this is uh how do you say um has a less priority it can be recognized as a uh, buffer in the worst case scenario so it's not as i mean it can work as a buffer capital so that's why it goes into this tier two capital and the thing is they say it cannot exceed 50 percent of total bank capital um, no more than 4% of risk-weighted asset. Uh, what is this risk-weighted asset? We're going to go there, go through a little later. A bit, a bit more complicated, but it's not uh, subject to our, uh, not too much of a subject in our discussion in this uh, semester, by the way. Okay, so that's that. Um, balance sheet of banks, risk-weighted assets. Well, There are four categories. Uh, I mean, they say they say four categories. Let's say, um, <clears throat> um, depending on you know in, in the bank's balance sheet. Okay, once you raise capital by um, first of all equity. Okay, shareholders have to get together and raise equity capital, and then deposit you receive from your depositors millions of them. And then let's say you issue bond, some part of it, uh, part of this, maybe subordinated debt and things like that, sub debt, right? Like that. And then once you raise capital like this from various sources, you invest and then you have to manage those things. And those things will show up in your asset side, okay? And then put some, uh, you can, Put some of your money into government bonds, treasury. Okay, that's the first, uh, first category over here. Okay, with this money that you raised, okay, raised in your uh, picture over there, right? Raised money, you put that into uh, different kinds of assets to make money out of it. Okay, make money based on your capital that you raised. Okay, um, 본장사, right? So government bonds, safest asset. And then short-term interbank assets, it can be there. Short-term interbank asset, well, you lend money to um, other banks. Supposedly, those other banks are safer, interbank. I'm not saying investment bank, but interbank over here, I, interbank. Um, bank to bank, lending and borrowing safer than other manufacturing or non-banking businesses because um you know it's you know they 
have been trying to keep their credit uh, worthiness as stable as possible thanks to the government's regulation and then they can raise capital easily and low, low rates and all these kind of things and then residential mortgages are there uh, are um, residential mortgages well 부동산 or real estate related uh, mortgage lending in america is there it's rather safer than other usual lending to uh, manufacturing companies or um, other small businesses right so those four categories they you know divide or categorize these assets and then um, depending on the riskiness they give different weights government is risk-free okay so that's why they say the weight risk weight for this u.s treasury investment has to be zero why zero because they want to compute right uh some kind of uh, risk waste uh, risk weighted buffer capital right uh you want to prepare right depending on the riskiness of your asset side of your business you want to have enough of a buffer capital right capital adequacy buffer capital and then this buffer size has to be smaller can be smaller if the asset is safer so if it is risk-free you don't need a buffer capital that's why the weight is zero that's the intuition here ah and then as it gets riskier you want to impose more risk weight so if you have a hundred billion dollars of treasury bond no need to have imposed any buffer capital but if you want to have a hundred billion dollars in short-term interbank assets 100 times 20 percent 20 billion dollars has to be set up as buffer capital for that ah 20 percent of this guy has to be here and then if you have 100 billion dollars of residential mortgages 50 percent of them which is 50 billion dollars has to be set up as buffer capital okay to meet the risk and then other assets 100 percent of it has to be recognized uh, or uh, work as a weight uh did i say 100 percent uh anyway so that's that thanks so <clears throat> if you look at the balance sheet of banks right um this bis regulation says roughly right uh let's set up uh, four different categories of asset okay um if you go into detail of it it's getting a lot more complicated and screws up your mind right um but roughly speaking four kinds of it will stand there but before we move on further right what do you mean by that well if you think about these balance sheet back again of the banks right i'm gonna you know this is gonna be my favorite part uh balance sheet it's not bullshit by the way and then left hand side asset and then to do your banking business you first have to raise up your capital among equity holders and then you do you know uh, deposits and issue bonds and subordinated debts and things like that right but your asset side of it you may have right with this raised capital you may do a lot of different businesses well with this tons of money what do you do okay well sometimes you want to invest in u.s treasury or risk-free asset the first one government risk-free treasury um and sometimes you want to uh, lend your money to other banks right interbank transaction ib i'm not saying investment bank but interbank relations right interbank lending right interbank lending or investing in other banks bond aha and then uh you can also lend your money into residential mortgages rm right uh retail i mean 부동산, like you want to buy your apartment or something like that your housing by the way u.s housing prices has been surging these days like crazy again oh my god easy money and then they just investing in them yeah that things are going on like that residential mortgages are there and other loans i say other assets right loans to uh, small businesses or big corporations or individuals and all these kind of things that's different from residential mortgages because it is not related to real estate things right so four different categories they say it in your asset 
but there is a different degrees of riskiness. Okay. Um, for government, I mean, depending on the riskiness, you want to prepare buffer capital as much. If it is risk free, we're going, we're, we're not going to worry about it so that, you know, we're not prepared for buffer capital. But if it is risky, we'll prepare more buffer capital for that kind of risky business. So government uh, bonds, risk-free, zero weight. Uh, when we compute a risk, uh, what is that? When we compute the buffer capital over here, right? Um, buffer capital in terms of what? We are not trying to, uh, we are not trying to uh, observe how much of equity you have. But here we are trying to estimate how much of a buffer capital you need. Okay, as a regulator, you want to impose how much of a buffer capital you need. Okay, and then compare that what is required by the regulation with the actual buffer capital that you have, right? So uh, versus, right, VS, what you have versus what you should have. This weight is about uh, how much you should have as a regulator imposing it, okay? Um, as your asset gets riskier in your investment, uh, you want more and more and more uh, set up as your buffer capital because riskier assets, there is a chance that it will shrink down a lot more, okay, in, the, in terms of market value. Um, so that's why you want to, have, want to have more preparation for that. Now, specifically how much? Well, I told you before, it's awfully complicated, but I'll tell you, uh, I'll give you some brief picture of it. Uh, it is deeply related to something called camel's analysis. Nakta, camel, the animal. No, it's like a, uh, the ways or framework of analyzing the healthiness, health of the financial institutions, depository institutions. C-A-M-L-S. Well, let's go one by one. C stands for capital adequacy that we are going through right now. And then asset quality, uh, that's you know, uh, the asset side of it, right? The left-hand side of the balance sheet. And management quality, how smart and you know, work ethic of these top guys, right? The human beings, right? Uh, how good are they, right? After all, it gets back to the human factor, right? Uh, earnings, yeah, net income, the income statement part of it. Liquidity, if you look at this uh, you know, asset side of it, liquid asset versus fixed asset, you see that. How much of it is liquid? And sensitivity, as the interest rate or macroeconomic factors fluctuate, how sensitive is your asset fluctuating accordingly? Um, all these uh, six aspects are important things to look at when you're analyzing those banks. Honestly, when I was in Bank of America, I was uh, at, for three months or something, I was belonging to this financial institution, credit analyst part, uh, analyzing the healthiness of Korean banks like Kyobuneng or Uriuneng or whatever Hambiruneng at that time, right? Awfully boring business. Awfully boring. <laughs> um, because I told you, right? The bank balance sheet. It's like, ah, like lack of imaginative. You know, it's like you cannot imagine any real stuff over there, but. Uh, I had to analyze from the perspective of this camel's analysis, right? Oh. But as I t tell you, right, in this presentation, things get more clearer and it gets more interesting than not, right? Um, you need actually to do, to be able to do this, right? Bank analysts, right? If you want to analyze you, those banks, right? You need to study macroeconomics a lot more, right? A lot more. Um, play with those economics majors, global economics, right? Kulche guys, right? Form some study groups together with them and go through those macroeconomic boring part and microeconomic, mathematical economics part. You have to be able to digest those things.
right? Don't say munsungamnida or whatever. Ah, I'm not an engineer major, so I don't bother me with this. No, if you are interested in kumyung uh, gongyeop and then trying to understand the healthiness of these financial institutions, you have to be able, you know, have to go through those painful parts, and then you will be able to understand the he better over here and then uh, you'll have better chance of getting jobs in Kumnyung Gongyo or this that the uh, public sector financial institutions like policy banks in Korea, Korea Development Bank or Kexim Bank, all these kind of things. You need to understand economics much more. Anyway, that's that. Example of capital adequacy though those regulators' perspective imposing how much of a capital you need, buffer capital you need. Well, this is the example over here. If you look at the asset of a hypothetical bank, let's say you have $100 million of US dollars of each different categories of assets. Government bonds, short-term interbank loans, and residential mortgages, and other assets. 100, 100, 100, 100, and 400 in your balance sheet on your left-hand side, right? Risk weight, 0, 20, 50, and 100% risk weight. And risk weighted assets, accordingly, will be simple multiplication of these things, right? Like this, okay? So 20, 0, 20, 50, and 100. In total, 170 is your risk weighted asset, even though your book value of your asset is uh, $400 million, your risk weighted asset is a lot smaller, 170, okay? Because you're applying these weights differently like this. And then the BIS, right? The Bank of International Settlement, they said, let's set up a minimum capital adequacy ratio, minimum BIS ratio, of eight percent okay so as long as that says as long as you have a certain amount of risk weighted asset we want you to have eight percent of this guy as your buffer capital if you multiply eight percent to this risk weighted asset that's 13.6 million dollars right so the dollar amount of minimum capital amount uh, has to be 13.6 million dollars according to BIS regulation and this BIS ratio should be tier 1 plus tier 2 capital which means your um, what is it your equity right you remember that part uh, retained earnings and then uh, common shares right and then plus what is it preferred stock and subordinated debt right that's tier one and tier two adding together you want your banks to have uh, more than 13.6 million dollars to manage your bank right uh, maximum tier two out of minimum capital 50 percent uh, the percentage should be 50 percent I'm, I'm not going to ask you this one in your exam but this is you know what it says uh, and then maximum of tier two capital amount if you apply this 50 percent to this guy, that should be $6.8 million, right? But what is important for most is this one, minimum BIS ratio, okay? So that's that. Now, if you uh, move down to the next one, I, uh, you see the balance sheet of JP Morgan. They, they show it in their notes, right, like this. I want you to go through some 10 Ks of U.S. banks, right? Mm. J.P. Morgan has been, you know, very prestigious one for over 100 years, right? Uh, Goldman Sachs is there, but it's majorly investment bank. Of course, it is now bank holding companies uh, after global financial crisis. But when it comes to commercial banks together with it, J.P. Morgan Chase is the, num the best one, I should say. J.B. Diamond is there. Uh, very good uh, CEOs, right? And then the risk management practice over there has been very good. So that's why. And then they, if you see that, they always say fortress balance sheet. As if you're more defensive, like fortress. Nobody can beat us. And we have stable balance sheet. I'll uh, give you some more idea about this financial stability uh, balance sheets. And then they show it CET1 capital, tier 1 capital. 
and then total capital, and then they show this ratio based on their uh, balance sheet amount, right? And then uh, following the BIS regulation, they show this kind of tier one, tier two capital ratios like this. Um, so that you can put it into perspective so that you can compare with the other financial institutions all around the world. So remember this number, tier one capital ratio, 13.3% over here. I show you the next slide, the um, capital ratios and BIS ratios of Shinhan Financial Group, okay? The bank holding company, okay? So be, to be able to compare with JP Morgan, 13.3% tier one capital ratio, that's around here, Shinhan Bank, right? Um, so they are close in terms of capital ratio, BIS ratio, and CET ratio, you can you know check out whichever whatever means over there, right? What most important things are here. Now that's that. Um, they show time series over the past three years and things like that. Yeah, 2020 is over here. I should have shown that anyway. Uh, capital adequacy standards are shown two of three. Right, while traditional bank capital standards protect depositors from traditional credit risk, they may not be sufficient protection um, from the derivatives risk. Uh, for example, right, um, 1995, right, there was a notorious case of uh, Bearings Bank, right, uh, collapse, right, because of the um, derivatives transaction and they did not manage their risk enough uh, because of the uh, derivatives transaction. There was too much speculating without managing proper management of the risk themselves, right? Um, the, which collapsed in 1995 from derivatives losses. If you took, if you take a derivatives class, right? Passing Sangpum loan. This is one of the famous cases that you study, right? And then Nick Leeson is the guy involved, uh, is a you know major you know who caused this kind of bankruptcy. And then the Barings Bank had, was uh, like uh, had a history of four hundred years or something, um, and then went bankrupt. And then it was sold to was sold to ING, a Dutch bank, for a price of two dollars or something. It's just a courtesy. It was. Even, you know, you know, it was not worth, right? Uh, negative amount, negative value was there. But, you know, the equity holders, you know, the ING, as a courtesy, they said, here, $2, just take it, you know. Um, it was a very famous case. Looked good on paper relative to the capital adequacy standards of the day. So the BIS ratio accord was there. And then the Bearings Bank seemed like they are doing okay. But as it turns out, their derivatives transactions made a huge loss so that they immediately went bank, uh, bankrupt like that. So the Basel II was established after, after this Bearings debacle. Um, the Bearings debacle, uh, you can watch the movie for free in YouTube nowadays, right? Um, yeah, one, one hour and 35, right? Go ahead and watch it. Uh, Ewan McGregor is starring, right? So that you can, in, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the Bearings Bank, the trouble, uh, all these play, place, right? Um, near, uh, Nick Leeson was working in Singapore, right? So you can see some Singapore flavor over there. And then, yeah, uh, Accord, Basel II Accord has been endorsed by central bank governors and bank supervisors in the G10 countries. Um, afterwards. Now, capital adequacy standards, well, uh, uh, now uh, it sets out the details of uh, adopting a more risk sensitive minimum capital requirements. Now, uh, talking about these derivatives, the asset class has to be reorganized. The key variable is the banks must is estimate the, are the probability of default and the loss given default for each asset on their books. So afterwards, all those financial engineerings about assessing those risks has developed like crazy. Uh, default prediction model using more mathematical and financial engineering models, 
start to bloom in 1990s and 2000s, right? Um, right. And then Basel II Capital Accord uh, was set. They had three pillars, minimum capital requirements and supervisory reviews and market discipline. They proclaimed it right like that. And then uh, everybody had to follow that one. Minimum capital requirements. And then that means incorporating credit risk and market risk and operational risk. Marking to market for traded assets. Now we're, I'm going to come back to this marking to market later on. Um, marking to market. Supervisory review process uh, was in, uh, enforced and then banks are required to conduct meaningful stress test to see if they could endure extreme economic situations. In Camel analysis, I told you, sensitivity analysis has to be there. And now stress test, okay, even more, right? Uh, Monte Carlo simulation, all these kind of things, right? Had to be going on. And effective use of market discipline. Well, transparent public disclosures of key information. The market discipline means like helping this market efficiency so that you transparently disclose more information so that people can understand your bank much more, much better. That's the idea, market discipline. Okay, now um, the next slide. Basel III is now is in place, right? Basel III. Basel II was enforced to, uh, you know, uh, help this stability of banking system. But it was still incomplete. We suffered from a uh, huge global financial crisis, right? And then the ba uh, Basel III is in place uh, afterwards. Since uh, 2019, Tier 1 is common. Uh, they classify only common equity and retained earnings. Tier 1 capital to be increased from 4% to 6% stringent ca uh, capital regulation. We want, we want more buffer capital. Okay, and, and then what's the consequence? Much better financial stability is uh, nowadays there. Thanks to that, right, after COVID-19 crisis, with, you know, uh, we are still okay. Uh, if, we don't, if we did not have this kind of regulation before, uh, the world must have ended last year, <laughs> right? We don't have enough capital, and then the whole central banks screwed together. And then the whole commercial banks screwed together, depository institutions, Armageddon situation. But with this, a lot better financial stability has been there. Um, yeah, so that's it for this part of the video. Thanks for watching. And then uh, see you in the next video. Thank you.